Welcome to Vets to PM's Military Transition Academy podcast, the show where we discuss how to succeed in transitioning from the military service to the civilian workforce. This show and the academy it represents helps veterans transition into meaningful, lucrative post-service careers. Your primary host is Eric Doc Wright, PhD, Certified Manager, Military Veteran, Serial Founder, Best-Selling business author, philosopher, linguist, and coach. Your other host is Jeremy Burdick, project management professional, scrum master, product owner, and retired Air Force chief, and the current COO of Vets to PM and the Professional Development Unit University, where we will interview veterans successful in corporate America and business to bring you nuggets of wisdom every episode to make you more successful. Next, let's introduce today's guest. Our guest today is Max Rogers, a former enlisted Marine who used the GI Bill to go to college to become a professional engineer. He was recruited in college for the Navy's nuclear power program and transferred into the Civil Engineer Corps during officer candidate school due to a color vision deficiency that disqualified him from submarine duty. The majority of assignments in the Navy were project management and leadership positions with a focus on contract administration and project team leadership. Max managed numerous multi-million dollar construction projects, facility maintenance contracts, and research and development programs. Upon retirement, he was recruited by his former command to accept a consultant position to support the program that Max had just retired from in order to transition from man diving systems to unmanned systems. 9-11 convinced him to pause his working career and fulfill a dream of sailing the Eastern Caribbean with his wife of five years. Max re-entered the working world via project manager positions that eventually led him to Houston and the energy industry where project management skills were recognized and rewarded. He retired from the energy industry as a project director and partner in an engineering firm after managing numerous domestic and international engineering and construction projects. Max is currently excited about the possibility of helping the next generation of vets to PMers while enjoying the success and financial security he was able to achieve in his working career. Lots of energy and information in this episode. So I can't wait to get started. So let's go. And you know, Max, the parallels, I mean, you, you talk to vets, uh, We, Jeremy and I talk to thousands of them a year and they all, you know, you go to TAPS class, maybe that's what you've seen. You, you've done a hitch, you've done a couple hitches, you've done 30 years, whatever. You go to TAPS class, you only hear what you're told, right? You only hear what your buddies on the other side of the fence tell you. So. Um, you know, a couple parallels. First of all, I met JB in San Antonio. So Tejas has uh, deep connections for me. Uh, secondly is regardless of what you did in the military. So here's what blows veterans minds all the time. When I meet them, you're prepared for the Civ Div. You just don't know it because they call you senior. They call you chief warrant. They call you uh, whatever they call you. We talk in leader, the civilians talk in management, but it's the same thing. You're going to run people. You're going to run shops and you're going to run projects. So think project mission, temporary, unique. Think shops, any department, division, gauge, cal shop, jet propulsion, shop, armory, anything you ever ran with an SOP. You and I used to talk about SOPs, uh, mm -hmm. Max. You know, so there's your operational management experience and taking care of your personnel, re uh, retention and uh, 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 readiness, right? That's all HR stuff. So what we tell vets is not just project management, man, but Talk about all of your experience doing operations management in general, running stuff, and your specialized experience running people and running teams and running missions. I mean, right there, you have about 80% of what corporate America is going to need you to do. And you're going to do that through your communication and leadership skills. Uh, like, done deal. And Translation there, done. And, and Doc, there, there's one very, very important trait that you, and you just failed to mention, and that is... The military is the only industry in the world that's, that prepares and plans for casualties. So one of the first things you learn as a leader in the military is you have to train your replacement. And he doesn't get trained after you've gone away. So you have to constantly make sure that if something happens to you and you don't come to work tomorrow, that the mission's not going to fail. The organization is not going to fail. There's going to be someone who's ready to stand up and take over. May, may, he may not be as proficient as you are or were. He may not be as good, but he'll be good enough. 
And the thing that I always focused on in the project environment was to find a project team member that number one, wanted some additional responsibility. And I would designate that person as my deputy project manager. And I would make sure that they focused internally onto the project team, making sure the project team members had everything they needed. They were properly equipped. They were properly uh, trained. They were properly supervised. And then I spent most of my time facing outward from the project team, focused on the client holding the client's hands and patting their head and telling them everything is going to be okay. And, and everything was, and then myself and my deputy would get together twice a day, first thing in the morning, last thing in the evening, and we would rub skulls and make sure that there was a complete uh, transmission of information. And that's exactly the way life in the military is. You know, you work, uh, you know, you understand a chain of command and, and you know the importance of communication. And that that just that that gives you such an unbelievable leg up when you go into the civilian world. I couldn't agree more at all. I mean, I, I really agree with you, Max. I think some of the things that uh, that you guys said is pretty astounding when you reel it back and and we replay it for the listeners is you say you don't get rich in the military you don't get rich monetarily but you do get rich in skills right some of these skills that you're going to roll out with can create incredible monetary wealth for you if you understand one how to harness them and i think max is a really good example of that taking the organizational skills taking the dependability the communication the servant leadership um, and I don't know if you guys caught it, but training your replacement is all about serving the people under you, right? That is servant leadership, making sure you're preparing people to replace you. That shouldn't stop in the civilian world, although it seems to um, dwindle a bit, but you, you're a standout leader when you do it. You're, like, you're unique. You're, you're helping them be better. And that's, that's just an amazing trait. So for anybody that you know doesn't want to back the tape up, that that's kind of the some of those big traits that Max was talking about and Doc uh, was emphasizing. You know, and it yeah, makes I, you a great scrum master too, gang. You know, a lot of people are like, "Hey, what do you call a project manager in an agile project?" We call him a scrum master. Well, it's not true. There's no such thing as a project manager in an agile project. There's a coach. There's a scrum master. There's a product owner, and there's the team. But here's the cool thing: vets have that skill that cross cuts the whole thing, and you can make a lot of money as a scrum master. By the way, gang. But that whole servant leadership mindset, if I take an old cat who's been raised like I used to be 20 years in a civ div, doing operations where you yell and scream, put boot to butt, and, you know, hey, I make I signed your paycheck, son, like get that stuff done. You you can still lead that way today, but you're not going to go very far and you're probably not going to be very successful. A servant leader, which, by the way, is a term the military made up. Servant leader is way to go. And that's that's what project managers do on scrum projects that's what coaches and, and and agile scrum masters do and every veteran that jb and i have placed max into agile project management dude they're killing it uh, of course you know <laughs> the greatest compliments i receive uh working in the the civilian world and the, and the workplace was that my team members would come to me and would uh, at some point during the project and and sit down and and face to face with me and say you know you're the first guy I ever worked for that seems like he really does care about me and I and I was floored when they would say that I said of course I care about you I care about you personally I care about you professionally and and I care about you today and I care about you in your future and that's why. I'm not it when you give me something that's substandard or that that doesn't meet the standards that, by the way, the project team established at the beginning of the project. This is not Max's standard. This is not your standards. This is one of the, the, the one of the, the the ground rules of building a project team is for that that norming process is when this, uh, you know, the team establishes what the standards are and. I'm the guy as the, the team leader that ensures that the standards are met. And then you hold people accountable for it. And then they appreciate that so much, especially the guys that are guys and gals who are sort of the, the, the yet to bloom roses, I used to call them. And um, 
they're there, they're ready. All they need is some sunshine and a little bit of water and, and uh, they're ready to go. And, and they don't need as much manure as most people think they do. They, uh, it's more sunshine and water is what they really need. So. How cool. How cool. I don't know if everybody create, caught it, but what a creative way to correct substandard, you know, behavior, products, deliverables, whatever you want to call them. When someone doesn't meet, it's it's actually better. It's 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 having compassion on that member to tell them the truth and say, hey, listen, we agreed that the standard would be this. This is what I see you produced. You're here. The standard was here. Let's work together to get it up rather than boots in behind, you know, hey, ah, oh, that was terrible, you know, and you're never going to make anything out of this project work. And this probably isn't a career for, for you. Maybe you should, you know, do something mm-hmm. else. It, very different, um, you know, very different, I guess, delivery. The way you just delivered it would show me that, hey, he does care about not just today, but my future. And I think as a project manager, when you're doing that, when you're when you're disciplining, if you want to call it that, or correcting or coaching, if you do it from, hey, I'm going to be here in the future and I want to see you surpass me. And the only way you're going to do that is rising above the standard, right? Delivering more. And, and let me share with you a little something that, that I learned and I used uh, in the oil and gas industry. One of the big first things you do when a project is sanctioned and during the initiation phase, you have to order project T-shirts. That that is the that's the that's the team uniform. You know, you know, button down collared shirts for the managers, polo shirts or T-shirts for the for the team members. And and that's one of the biggest days in the project is the day that the shirts arrive in the office. So and and I learned that quite quick, quickly. So so I, I was running this one project for a, a super major oil company and I was working at an installation contractor. And uh, the shirts came in and word spread throughout the building immediately. Hey, the shirts are in for for Max's project, you know. So there were people coming by. Hey, can I get get a shirt? Can I get a shirt? Well, hang on, guys. I'm going to I'm going to announce it tomorrow. I'm going to put them out tomorrow. So there was a project team meeting scheduled for the next day. So at the at the team meeting, one of the first things I did is, hey, guess what, everybody? The shirts are in. So so here's what I want to do. They're they're in two big, large uh, cardboard boxes sitting in the corner of my office. So. What I want you to do is everyone on the project team that to to date has contributed something significant to the successful completion of the project. I'd like for you to swing by my office and go in and help yourself pick your pick your shirt out and, uh, you know, pick whichever one you want, what size, what what size. And uh, and then every Friday, I'd like for everybody to wear their project team shirts to the office. Well, just as I I expected. The, the first guys to, to show up to get their shirts were the ones that were the what I call the, the, the middle 80 percentile performers. And, and they were, they were contributing to the project. But there were some guys who would show up sheepishly and ask if they could have a project T-shirt. And I would say, sure, you can, as long as you can tell me what have you done to you know, contribute to the success of the project. If you're doing something to contribute to the project, I want you to wear this, this shirt. And some some of them would slink away and some would tell me things that I wasn't exactly aware of. And, and so they would get their shirt. Well, but then there was always what always amazed me is there was always one or two top performers that didn't come by to get a shirt. And I would find them later in the day and say, hey, well, why haven't you come by and got your shirt? Well, I, I didn't know if I really you know uh, deserve it or not. I, well, what do you mean? You know, let's let's talk about what you're doing. So I'd spend, you know, five minutes standing up by the coffee machine there, tell them about, you know, their contributions to the team, and what they did. And yes, they deserve it. The reason that we we have these shirts is for guys like you to wear. And I, but it, I almost had to force the ones, the, some of them to go get them. But it was a it was a great incentive and it was a, a great way to, to t- you know, thing in team building. And, and, and it let people know that you care about. Them. And the, the biggest thing was the members of my project team, they wore their, their shirts with such pride because they, they knew everyone in the company knew that they were all, the only reason they were wearing that project 
team t-shirt was because they were contributing to the success of that project. They wasn't just, you know, in a box there, go get a shirt and wear it if you want to. You know? So, uh, so it was a, a great little incentive and uh, it, it worked well. And I learned to do that when I was uh, during my career in the military, but one example that I always, uh, always remember, I was a company commander in a CB battalion. And, you know, CBs are a bunch of undisciplined Marines. You know, they, they dress like Marines, but they build, they build and fight, but, uh, but they're just, they don't have the discipline of Marines. So we had our standards, our, when we had personnel inspections, the standard was you had to have a regulation haircut, a fresh shave, and a clean serviceable uniform. And that was it. That was the standard. So when I held personnel inspections, that was the standard that I, I judged people by and you upheld. There was this one second class petty officer named McElroy. I'll never forget this guy. Every day he looked like a Marine. He showed out up in spit shine boots and starched uniforms. And I used to kid him about, hey, McElroy, you're in the wrong service, man. You, you go to dress like that. You should have been in the Marine Corps, you know. So one day I'm doing a personnel inspection. I'm going down to first squad and everybody's meeting the standards. And here's Petty Officer McElroy. And he's standing there, this, this, this immaculate dress CB. And I was so impressed by him. I was, I wanted to do something, give some kind of reward for this guy. So, and at the time I was trying to break the nasty habit of dipping skull in Copenhagen. So I would, I had pockets full of these uh fireball candy you know penny candies that every time i wanted to take a dip i'd put a fireball in my mouth instead of a, a dip of copenhagen so i reached in my pocket and i got one of these fireballs and i said here petty officer mackerel you look so good you deserve an award so i'm going to give you this this fireball for your reward for your reward and i didn't think a whole lot of it until the next time we did a personnel inspection then there's three or four guys standing there in starch uniforms and spit shine boots far above the standard. So I had to give out more fun ones. But the, the lesson that I learned from it was recognition doesn't have to be something spectacular. It doesn't have to be a brick of gold. It can be something as simple as a one penny piece of candy, but it's just the recognition of the fact that, and these, these CBs, became bound and determined that they were going to get a piece of candy from Mr. Rogers at the next personnel inspection. And, and it was amazing what an effect it had in the company and even in the battalion, the, the, the battalion XO came down and asked me, Hey, you know, Max, what have you done? How have you squared Charlie company away so much, man, that your guys look great at personnel inspection. I said, you're not going to believe it if I tell you. So here, so I tossed him a piece of candy and he caught it out of midair and he goes, what's this? He goes, I said, that's how you get a company of CBs to square themselves away. And all it takes is a penny piece of candy. So. You know, what's amazing, folks, as you're listening and you don't know Max. So let me tell you a little bit about where this guy cut his chops. So you just heard him. He come out of CB battalions, right? He's been all over the fleet. When he was done with that, retired from his first career. He then went into oil and gas, and I'm not talking about oil and gas to roughnecks in the fields. I'm talking about oil and gas, the same oil and gas in the fields, except he had to lay a, add a layer of challenge on it. going to do it in three, four, five, eight thousand 8,000 feet of water out in the middle of the ocean, right? So, gang, this stuff you're hearing him say, it's not like he's in an office somewhere in air conditioning working 8 to 5 Monday through Friday. This guy cut his chops in some environments that are some of the most inhospitable on this planet. But he's still taking care of people. He's still taking care of the project. He's still taking care of the customer and the stakeholder. I mean, j just think about that for a second, right? I mean, and that's, Max, that's what's always blown me away, man, when you share your stories with me. Is It's like, you know, you guys aren't sitting in a conference room around a table somewhere, but you talk about management's got a collar on and the boys and the gals got, you know, polo shirts on. Like, you can still set standards and use subtle peer pressure to influence the way the entire team behaves and your guys and gals perform above the standard because not a bunch, of, a bunch of individuals. We got a project to do. We're a project team. We all got T-shirts on. We get to wear them every Friday. That Everybody in the company wants to be us, but they can't because they're not contributing like us. Right. I mean, man, you, you talk about getting people to give that extra something, right, other than a paycheck. Man, and it doesn't cost a ton of money, doesn't take a ton of effort. You know, just amazing, amazing. 
And that's the thing that comes natural to veterans too. And it's, it's the, it's one of those things, I call it the magic sauce. And it's, it's, uh, you know, I was telling Jeremy last week, I was working for uh, doing a project for BP and then had a successful project with them and then was invited to come join them to mainly to teach their project managers how to manage the project with the discipline that I had just completed this, this project in the Atlantis field went in. And right after I started work there, uh, a young top tier young engineer from, from that company came plopped himself down in, in my chair in front of my desk and said, said, look, I just signed up for the mentoring program and I've selected you to be, I want you to be my mentor. And I was flattered, but I told him, I said, look, I'm, I'm not an employee. I'm a contractor. I don't know they'll let this, this go. He goes, oh, I've already cleared it with the top guy. And yes, you know, it's good to go. And I said, well, great. So why do you want me to be your mentor? And he goes, well, he goes, you remember the first meeting you came to over here in this building? And this, this building was in a 26-story building on the campus of BP there in Houston. And I looked at him and, and I said, well, I, yeah, I vaguely remember he goes oh he goes he goes I remember it distinctly he goes he goes you walked in this room he goes he goes there were 40 people in the room he goes you didn't even sit at the conference table he goes you sit in a chair against the wall and he goes and we went at it for two hours just scattered all over there he goes and you stood up and said hey wait a minute guys if we're going to get this project complete we got to have some structure and some order this whole thing he said you walked up to the front of the room and got to the whiteboard there and you started organizing all the chaos that was going on he goes and everybody in that room realized in that moment that okay we got a team leader here he is right here and he said i'll never forget that he goes and i worked with these guys for years and he goes and they're some of the most combative hard-headed guys you ever met in your life and he goes but everybody realized that you were the right guy at this at this time at that point and uh I said, well, you know, I appreciate that. And he goes, so what I want you to do, he goes, I want you to teach me to do how to do that. And I said, okay, great. And that young man today is, is at the upper end of middle management at that one of the major oil companies in the world. And someday wouldn't surprise me a bit in the world if he's not the CEO of, of a, an international oil company. And because he's, he's a super guy, but he, he wants to be a good leader. And He'd never really been exposed to leadership. And that that leadership that we have, that we learn in the military, is the secret sauce. That's the, that's the stuff that everybody in the civilian world has never seen before. They've heard about it. They've read about it. But they've never experienced it. But, boy, the first time they experience it, they got, man, here's a guy who's competent. He's conscientious. He's the hardest working guy in the group. He's the first one in in the morning. He's the last one out in the evening. He doesn't tell us what we need to be doing. He shows us what he's doing and we learn from him and we follow by his example. And he's willing to do anything that we're doing out here, whether it's if we got to go down to a shipyard and open up a shipping container and spend all day in the dirt counting out parts, then, hey, you know, he's part of it. And you, it's that stuff that we learn to do in the military and 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 take for granted. But but it's a it's a it's a plentiful resource in the military. It's a scarce resource in the civilian world. Yeah, that's great. So, Max, I mean, it sounds like you kind of were when you were in the service, you were already a project manager. What what did you connect? When's that first dot you started to connect? with, hey, I'm in the service. I may be a project manager. Do you remember that like moment where it was like, okay, I think I can do this? Or was there a tool that you used or what What really ignited that passion? Yes, Jeremy. I, I had, I'm going to give you two examples. The, the first one is when I, my first project that I remember being assigned to me, I was a corporal in 1st Radio Battalion in Hawaii in the, in the Marine Corps. And I had been assigned to the battalion training office. And I go in there and there was a gunnery sergeant, an E7, who was the battalion uh, training NCO. So I go in and I'm my first day there. And uh, I said, OK, Gunny, you know, what are we doing here? He goes, ah, he goes, we all have to spend our time here in, in the training office. You know, he said, so we just sort of keep things going. And, 
And I said, well, you know, come on, let's, but there's more to it than this. He goes, well, hey, you, you can just do as much as you want. So I realized that, 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 that first of all, it, uh, we needed to document the kind of training program we were having. So did a little research, said, okay, pretty simple. How do you document something? Well, you know, first thing you got to have assigned someone to be an instructor to teach a training course. Then that person needs to have some kind of training tool to use a, a syllabus or a training guide or something. So you need a you need a copy of that. Then whoever attends training, there needs to be a record of it. So so have a uh, uh, an attendance roster. And then after the training is completed, you need to get the people who receive the training to fill out questionnaires or surveys about what was beneficial about the training, how the training could be improved, stuff like that. And then you take those four documents, put them together and put them in a file. And guess what? You've got documentation that training was scheduled, training was held, and training was effective, and it was all recorded so that then uh, you know, there was a record of it. So I started doing this for all the training and, and took it on and, and, and as a project, I didn't realize that, that it was a project at the time. I thought it was just my job and put it all together. And, uh, the gunny came over a couple of weeks later and said, Hey, you know, but man, this, this is great. How did, how'd you come up with it? I said, I don't know. I just, you know, I just seemed to the, the right way to organize, it, you know, put it all together. So several months later, uh, we had an inspection from the the commanding general of the third Marines came over and, and held an impromptu training inspection. And he's going through and uh, this colonel came as a full bird colonel in 06. He comes over and he walks up and, and he starts questioning the, the, the gunny about our training program and how, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? How do you, how do you know this? How do you know this has happened? How do you know this? Uh, and the gunny struggled with it for a little while. Finally, he stopped. He goes, look, Colonel, he goes, in all honesty, he goes, the guy running this whole thing is this corporal right here. He goes, this is his his baby. He put the whole thing together and he can answer all your questions. But this colonel looks at me, he goes, oh, OK, Corporal Rogers, he goes, so how do you do this? Well, you know, how, how do you know that 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 you're getting the, the proper training schedule? I said, well, I take the battalion training and then I break it down by each company and I make sure there's a training schedule published each week. And we go there. he goes, well, then, you know, uh, how do you how do you know that that pe- this training is being held? Well, I, I sign you know, instructors to teach it. And then here's the syllabus they use. And here's the attendance roster of the guys. And then here's the critique sheets, you know. So he sat there and he, he questioned me for probably 30 minutes to an hour about this. And, but everything he asked, I, I had answered to his questions. So he stood there and he turned around and he looked at the gunny and he goes, you know, he goes, he goes, I don't believe this. He goes, he goes, I don't believe that a corporal in the United States Marine Corps could put together a program like this to run it. And the gunny's shaking his head and he goes, yep, he did it, sir. And he goes, nope. He goes, I refuse. He goes, I wouldn't allow this to get out that a corporal in a Marine Corps could do this. And he walks out, he turns around, he stands up and pray. He goes, stand up, corporal. So I stood up, he goes, raise your hand. And he promoted me to sergeant on the spot. He goes, he goes, I'd be embarrassed to let the word get out that a corporal came up with his training program. So that that was my first project. And I got instantly rewarded because I got a promotion and it came with a pay increase. And it's like, wow. So then fast forward to uh, 1986. I graduated from college, just gotten a commission in the Civil Engineer Corps. And my first duty station was at Barksdale Air Force Base in Shreveport or in Bossier City, Louisiana. So I get there and I show up and said, okay, what I do is say, hey, you're a construction contract manager. I said, okay, what is it? I'll, I can probably re- re- recall that, but what do I do? He said, well, here, here's the construction contract. There's the construction contractor, manage it. To the, here's the schedule, here's the budget, manage it. So that was the first project that I was given, but the Civil Engineer Corps of the Navy is populated by project managers. That is the, 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 the greatest resource of professional project managers that the Navy trains. They sent me to, to basic school in Port Wanamie to learn about the Civil Engineer Corps. I learned about contracts, construction contracts. I learned how to, to develop a contract, how to administer a contract, how to award a contract, how to cancel a contract, how to terminate a contract, how to close out a contract. 
got all this formal contract training. And then, and then, and my career, I got advanced classes and I got classes in public works administration because we, in the civil engineer corps, they, the officers in the civil engineer corps or the, the Navy's construction contract managers, the public works administrators, and then the officers in the CBs. So you get to do the fun hoorah stuff in the CB battalion and, and go out and travel the world and build and fight and, 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 and shoot a Mark 19 grenade launcher and, uh, and, and, and build machine gun nests and do all this fun stuff. And you get to build, you know, equipment and infrastructure and put in, you know, uh, hydrant refueling systems and build aircraft hangars and, and build buildings and build all the infrastructure and, and repair waterfront facilities and build waterfront facilities and, and subsea facilities. I, I got to put in, you know, subsea pipelines and, and subsea cable systems. So I was fortunate to, to be in the Civil Engineer Corps which is a, a training ground for professional project managers. And the most amazing thing to me is no one in the civil engineer corps ever told me that. I, I don't think they realize they, they consider themselves professional engineers. You're an engineer and that's, it's all the technical stuff, but you know what? Nobody in the civil engineer corps works as an engineer. They work as a project manager. They're leading people. They're given resources whether, and they're given schedules and, and they're expected to complete the task on the, on the schedule, within the budget, and without anyone getting hurt, without any injuries. And that, by anyone's definition, is a project manager. You know, Jeremy, I was just thinking, man, I don't know if you know this or not, Max. We train all over the fleet, but, man, we love in the services, but, but we love Coast Guard, you know, at their different stations. We love going to Wainimi and training. Um, JB, we got to take Max with us next time we go to Wanimi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we'll stomping grounds. I, that was my, I was in NMCB3 station there, and I went to basic school there. And then my last assignment uh, was in the deep submergence program. And we did a lot of work out of the Port Wanimi is the Navy's, it used to be the Navy Civil Engineering Laboratory. And they changed the name to the Navy Facilities Engineering Service Center. So uh, without without thinking that, what used to be, you know, our acronyms in the in the Navy, you know, the Navy Civil Engineering Laboratory was NCEL, and then the Navy Civil uh, Navy Facilities Engineering Service Center is NAV Feces, and they didn't think that all the way through, but uh, but now it's still affectionately known as NAV Feces. Yeah, yeah, we've been out there a couple times, and we love those folks. I mean, they're. They're spot on professionals. You know, I mean, that's just like you said, you, you couldn't explain it any better is that they're professional project managers. And a lot of the stuff we're teaching them is just the way PMI thinks, not necessarily how every project rolls, but to pass and get that credential so that they've got it when they do transition, which really actually brings us to the, what I would, would like to hear from you next is, you know, what, what are some of the things and advice that you'd give to people as they're about to transition from the military like what are some of those skills I and mean, we know they're bringing a lot of skills with them but what do they need to hone and work on to become successful civilian project managers or managers just in general well i think jeremy the first thing is exactly what you and doc were preaching is you got to learn the new language you got to get away from the military acronyms and you know watch standing and mission accomplishment and all these other things and understand that what what uh and, and, you know the chain of command is now stakeholders and your your you know team the good news is teammates are teammates still and team members but it's it's important because if you don't speak number one the the civilian world doesn't speak military language and they're not interested in learning the military language you know, and those of us who have been in the military still constitute less than 1% of the population of our country. So if you expect the civilians to learn mill speak, it ain't going to happen. So getting out of the military and transitioning successful into civ dev, as, as Doc calls it, requires you to learn to speak the language of civ dev. It, it's not difficult. It's just new. It's something different. That's all you need to do. Um, the other thing is to the next thing that I guess I would I would focus on 
is decide whether or not you want to focus on your technical expertise or your managerial expertise. Because either one is there's a lots of lucrative opportunity out there. Uh, the skills that you're taught in the military, you know, if you're if you're a jet engine mechanic, you know, working on an F-35 is different than working on a Boeing 787. But you know what? It ain't that much different. It, an engine's an engine. It's the it's uh, it, it's like, you know, if you're a diesel mechanic, you know, whether or not that that diesel is on a ship or whether or not that diesel is on a piece of, of construction equipment or whether or not that diesel is a is a gener runs a generator for backup generator. It's a diesel engine. You know, it sucks, squeeze, bang and blow. It's a diesel. That's the way it goes. And so so, you you know that. And if you want to pursue and stay in the technical line of work, it's out there for you. There's plenty of things for you to do. On the other hand, if you want to work in managing people and, and managing resources and taking responsibility is the big thing for to, that you're the guy that stands when they, when they ask the question, okay, look, I got this pool of people. I got this amount of material and I got this amount of time and I got this little pot of money. Who's willing to stand up and take all this and deliver a completed project in nine months from now? It's the per the guys in the military ones that stand up and say, hey, man, that sounds cool. I'll do that. I can I can do this. You know, and you go do that. And and it's it's very rewarding. Uh, right now, I've uh, I have I can't count on both my hands the the number of people who are still working in the oil and gas industry that used to work with me and now you know it's watching them grow up like watching your kids you know graduate from school i guess but uh you know they're now they're doing different things some of them are still in oil and gas business some of them are doing other things i have, I have a, a young girl came out of texas a m that, that worked for me as a and her first job and uh, was on one of my project teams. Today, she is one of the senior reliability engineers at SpaceX in, in Cape Canaveral. And she's hiring people. She's on LinkedIn every day hiring people. And, uh, you know, I watch this girl grow up in, in the professional world. And it's it's very satisfying. It's it's as, as satisfying as, as when you're in the military, watching the guys underneath you successfully pass their rating exams and get promoted. And, and, and most importantly, at the end of a, of a deployment, they get, you get to parade them up in front of the commanding officer and stand there and they, they pin that free salad on their chest, you know, and, and give them that recognition so that, you know, as they walk out into the world, the rest of the military, people can identify, hey, the top performers, you know, you're looking at a guy's chest, you see achievement medals, you see accommodation medals, you know, you see Legion of Merits, you see those, those personal awards that, that people are given for their performance and you it's immediate credibility. And uh, so, you know, you have that in the military and then you got to transfer that to the civilian world with, with, and the landmines that you have to avoid is intimidating people. We, we never had any problem in the military sitting around first thing in the morning drinking cups of coffee and, and clubbing each other over the head because who are climbing up the ladder about who's going to be the best, who's going to get their job done best, who's going to who's going to be the number one lieutenant in a in a CB battalion with 12 to 14 lieutenants who, you know, when they do annual evaluations, there's only going to be one, the one of 12. He's the guy. And and you 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 have this uh, professional camaraderie, but yet uh, professional challenges that you have with each other to be the best. And to be honest with you, in a lot of civilian worlds, they find that intimidating. So you can't you can't embark on it like it's a competition. Because the, the competition is that the team succeeds. That's the competition. No, no you got you have to sub, su suppress that that uh, concept of personal performance and, and personal uh, accomplishments, and focus on the team. It's all about the team. And you know you're going to have some top ten percenters. You're going to have some bottom ten percenters, and you're going to have what I call the middle eighty percent, which is 
where the vast majority of people are somewhere in that spectrum. They're not in the top 10. They're not in the bottom 10. They're somewhere in the middle. So you have to figure out how to get a good day's work out of them to get their contribution to the project team so that the, 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 the project itself is successful and goes forward. And we've all had to do that. I mean, you know, unless you're in, in some kind of, you know, special operations command or special forces command, you don't get to pick the guys on your team. You, you, you have to play the hand you're dealt when you show up somewhere. And that's the way it works. You know, I, I, I used to chuckle when I was studying for my PMP exam, uh, how PMI talks about initiation of a project. And when, when once you're given to all, uh, assign the tasking and what the project is all about, then you go out and recruit and select your project team. Uh, you know, that that's one of the funniest things I ever heard in my life. I never got to select my project team. I was given a group of people and said, here, make this happen. And, and you've got to work with what you've got. You don't get to pick the guys on your team. So, and uh, you, know, you can, you can get rid of the ones that aren't performing as long as you, and that, that's, that's a shock too to most people in the civilian world. But once again, you establish the, the team standard, you let the project team establish the standards of performance. When someone doesn't meet the standards of performance, you bring them in, says just like counseling in the military. You counsel, you tell them that, hey, your performance is not up to the standards. So, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to work up a program just for you to get you up to performing to the standards that the team has determined is the are the minimum standards. Then you give them, you work with them and you help them. And but then after a period of time, if they're still not capable of performing, you got to say goodbye to them and you got to let them go. And then you got to go beg for more resources. So you know, Jeremy, as I'm listening to Max talk, I mean, a couple things just jumped right out at me. So, you know, <clears throat> civilians don't wear their accomplishments on their chest or their collars or their sleeves. They don't have devices to show that. So I think credentials are a good way to do that. You don't have four years to do a bachelor's degree. Cool. Get a credential. And then, you know, that always Max starts the argument on LinkedIn and other social media platforms. Well, like, you know, does PMP make a project manager? No, it doesn't. And I never said it did. Uh, and it, you still got to have a conversation with the person you're interviewing or promoting or whatever about whether they're any good at project management. However, they now talk like a project manager. They use tools like a project manager and they have a credential that they got voluntarily, which demonstrates initiative, leadership, motivation, commitment to the profession. I mean, you know what I mean? So right there, you can sense a couple things just by that ribbon they got on their chest. The other thing too is it's, it is professional, right? Whether you put any stock in the credential or not, it is a professional credential, right? So I think I always tell our vets, you know, hey, credential is speed to recognition. You take three, four, six, eight weeks, go get your HR, go get your project management credential. And I don't care which one it is. I'm not saying PMI maybe owns the market. I'm saying go get one that your employer or the future employers that you want to work for recognize You'll talk like that. You'll look like that. You'll act like that. And somebody that's a third party said you are that, right? And whether you go be that for a living, hey, I'm an HR specialist, or hey, I'm the director of HR, or I'm the project manager uh, director in the PMO. The reality is, man, you're going to have to work with people and you're going to get assigned a project, whether you're leading it or you're on the team. So you might as well put that stuff in your resume, your LinkedIn profile and get credit for it, <laughs> Right. It just makes a difference on a piece of paper when they're matching you up against 12 other cats that are trying to beat you out. Doc, you're, you're exactly right. And there, and there is a, an, an exact parallel between in project management and engineering. In the engineering profession, each state licenses engineers as professional engineers so that when you are hired or you're working as an engineer, especially if you're doing engineering in what's called the public domain, if you're building roads and bridges and, and structures that, that are housing people, if those buildings aren't engineered properly and they fail and fall down and there are casualties due to that, you're going to be held responsible for that. So they, they, the engineering profession came up with this idea, OK, we'll allow the states to perform, uh, uh, pro have engineering exams. You get licensed as an engineer by the state, wherever state you're in, and then the different states order reciprocity. So you, you're not, you're not com, 
uh, confined to live and work and practice in one state. The in the project management world, PMI, and then uh, uh, I forget the in Europe there is another uh, organization similar to PMI. Prince that, too, yep. Yep, they they a prince. Yeah, exactly. They offer a credential, and and what what that is what that certifies or signifies is that this is a person who has had the proper training in project management. They have demonstrated their knowledge of project management by taking this uh, um, test that's an exam, which is a a long, arduous four-hour exam. And then you have, by your professional conduct and your standards, but the fact that you're a member of the Project Management Institute, you're a dues-paying member, you attend meetings, and you, you know, you get continuing education uh, uh, courses and things like that. So you continue to go. So it's 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 easy to show your professionalism. But then when someone asks, uh, you know, in, in, in organizations like large oil companies and stuff like this, when they're sanctioning a project, they're talking years, five years to develop the project. They're talking billions of dollars. And then they're talking, okay, they're going to entrust this project to some person. Who who are we going to who are we going to entrust this project to? And their nominees made. Well the first question is okay, how do we know that the this person is qualified to do this? First thing is well he has a PMP qualification uh, certification. So so the project management institute says He's a project manager. So that's wicket number one. Wicket number two, he's been here at the company for eight, 10 years. He's worked, he's managed other projects of similar scope. Uh, and, and he's well worked in this type of technical environment. He's worked with this number of groups of people before. So, so you build up, you know, a stack of, of, um, of um, documents and, and credentials to prove that this person is capable to do it. And then they make a selection. And, and but if you don't have a credential like a PMP or an engineering degree or something like that, you're never gonna get, you're never gonna get the, the, to start the consideration for it like that. So, so it is important. And the thing that I realized immediately was that it's readily accessible. I mean, you know, to, to get a professional engineer's license, you got to go to for four, at least four years to a university that's accredited by ABET and get an engineering degree. Then you have to work for several years under a professional registered engineer and him, him observe your work. Then you apply uh, a, an applet, send in an application to the state, and then you take the exam, and then you're licensed as a professional engineer. That takes years and years and years, you know, six, seven, eight years. Whereas the PMP, as long as you have 36 months experience in, in working in the project environment and working on a project team and, 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 and being involved in project management, you, you can pass the, the, the PMI exam, then you're credentialed a project management f- professional. You know, you can do it in, in less than, than three years, easy in the, in the project environment. But, but the first step is to get that credential. The good news is that the vets coming out of their military service, they, they've done 36 months worth of project management already. They may not know that, they may not understand that, but, but when they, they sit down with someone like you and Jeremy and even myself, who can sit down and go through their their record book and look at their assign their job assignments and look at what they've accomplished and where they've been assigned and what they've done, and it's easy to find 36 months worth of experience of managing projects and leading teams and, and you've got it already. So you go join PMI and you and the thing that, that I'm so impressed with is what when I met you is you're providing, you're facilitating this studying that needs to be done to learn this new language. When I got when I took my PMP, I didn't I never heard of bets to PM. I I never never heard of I didn't know there was an organization anywhere that could help me prepare and study. So I spent nights and weekends sitting at my desk with a PMBOK 
and going through all the processes and learning it myself. And, and it was arduous. It was difficult. It, and it took me, me many, many hours. I still have the note, notebook. I, I bought a, uh, a, a, a specific notebook to use to write. I'm, I'm the kind of person that the way I learn is I have to read something. I have to take notes. I have to transcribe those notes. And if I write something down at least two times, I got it in my little pea brain after that. But I kept that notebook and and I keep it and I kept kept the edition of the PMBOK that I studied under and took the exam under. And because it represents a lot of effort that I had to put forth. But man, was it worth it. It uh, it it allowed me the opportunity, the consideration for for positions and jobs that I've never been uh, considered for again. And uh, and it was extremely rewarding from both personally, professionally, and financially. You know, it checks a block, right? It starts a conversation. Hey, I need a project manager. Cool. What's the first criteria? I don't know. Hey, is there a credential for that? Yes, there is. Cool. So let's look at 60 candidates and make a short stack for interviews. How many of them have a credential? <laughs> it almost doesn't matter what credential it is. Just do you look different on paper? Did some independent third party body look at your body of work and say, hey, this guy or gal has done this thing for a living? Exactly. I mean, oftentimes that gets you into the conversation. That's what interviews are for. Now go in there and sell what kind of yep. badass project manager you are. Right. Exactly. But you at least got invited to the conversation. Exactly. And that's where you get to demonstrate your enthusiasm and your knowledge and your bearing your, you know, that you can go sit in front of you can, you know, I mean, it's, it's this, what I consider a dying art today of how to meet someone where, you know, you walk up and you, you offer a firm handshake and you look them dead in the eye and you, you carry on a conversation with them and you connect with that person. And that's, uh, that's something that, you know, that, that once again, I think vets are just, uh, innately in tune to that because they they forced us to do that. You know, like you 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 go somewhere for a year, two years, and then you get orders, and you got to go somewhere else, and you start all over again. You know, and you you walk in the door, and and no matter what's what are you wearing on your chest and what are you wearing on your sleeve, you know, there's 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 minimal expectations formed there, but but uh, the the real expectation is in that first ten minutes that when you're in a new command or you're in a new position that the people around you are going to form. And it's, uh, it's, it's the old adage, you know, you, you never get a second chance to form a good first impression. And uh, so it's, um, but um, my experience has always been in, in the civilian world, the veterans that I worked with and that I, I ran into and that came in and interviewed with me. Oh, I always wanted to, and, and usually did. And uh, just because and it, it, it wasn't the fact that, oh, we got this brotherhood of being vets. No, it wasn't that. It's that that these are the guys they're accomplished, the guys and gals. And they 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 can do the job. There's no doubt. And if they don't know how to do the job, they'll learn how to do the job. They they have the capability of doing it. They just they may have to learn how to do it. And I had to do that. There were numerous uh, positions that I was put in that I had no idea how to do. It. But I had the opportunity to learn, and uh, and it worked out just fine. So, and you know, it's people skills. That E four is going to talk to the colonel, and when that time comes, because Colonel walked over and said, "Hey, Corporal, what's going on over here? What you doing?" That E four, I've been trained. I have the bearing. I have the knowledge. I have the cool confidence. Colonel's addressed me. I'm just going to reply to the colonel, and I'm going to give him or her direct answers. I'm going to answer the questions I was asked. You know, I'd, I all the time I, I mentor junior project managers, civilians, right? I, I mean, I help project managers be better project managers, regardless of you know whether you wore the uniform or not, right? I just have a special place in my heart for those that wore the uniform. But you know, I I, I tell every project manager this: Hey, look, here's the reality: you're going to stand in front of a CFO someday. You're going to stand in front of an ops manager. You're going to stand in front of people and you're going to have to interact with them while other people cower in the back of the conference room because, oh my God, nobody talks to the COO. Nobody gets talked to the CFO except her staff or, well, <laughs> you're running their project, son. Your daughter, you're going to talk to that person. So be respectful, be confident. Don't be cocky, but be confident, be competent, know the answers, have done the homework. Hey, if this was my project and I'm the CFO and I cared about the budget, 
what are probably the first four things I'm going to ask in a meeting about my project and my budget? You're probably going to get that question. And if you have the first couple handled and they throw you a zinger question number five, hey, ma'am, you know what? That's a dang fine question. In fact, it's so good, ma'am, I'm not prepared. Tell you what, I'll get back to you in 24 hours if that's all right, ma'am. That's a perfectly fine answer. Now they know you're not bullshitting them too. So you just you just gained a little bit of respect in their book, right? So, you know, that's the litmus test. You're going to stand in front of a senior. You just better prepare for it. And don't you're exactly it. right. I don't know is not an incorrect answer. No, and that's and, and I I've always tried to to impress that upon especially younger people as they're 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 working their way up the ladder is hey look if I ask you a question you know I expect the answer to be accurate all right and I expect the answer to be correct and if you don't know the answer by when you tell me I don't know the answer that's a correct answer in my okay now and I would hope that when you you immediately follow up with, I don't know the answer, but I'll go look it up. I'll be right back. OK, that's fine, because, you know, if, if there's not rounds coming in through the perimeter, there's nothing we got to do right now. All right. We can we can we can push the pause button and we can talk about it later. So. Yeah. Accuracy beats immediacy, you know, just because it's, you know, bad information right now is not necessarily good. Accurate information a few minutes from now, much better. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I dig that. Now you you 24 up. hours from now, right? Just yeah. just do what you said you do. That's what builds trust. Hey, That's ma'am, what... sir, I don't know, but I'll get back to you in 24 hours. I'll get back to you in three days. I'll get back to you and just get back to them whenever you said you would, even if it's, hey, ma'am, I'm still researching it. That was a very complex issue. Here's where I'm at. Here's where I think I'm going. They mm -hmm. Now they know they're being attentive. You're being attentive. They're being attended to. They're being taken care of, and they can trust you to do what you say you'll do. Right. That's it. That puts, that puts equity into the relationship too. Like you're building, like you said, the, the trust with them. You're not just going to BS them. You're going to build the trust because you're going to give them accurate information. It may not be the exact moment they need it, but it's going to get to them before uh, the decision time or whatever. They'll, they'll, they'll square you away on the timeline that they need it by. I learned at a very young, as, as a young Marine, one of the first field exercises that I was doing, I, mean, I was in a radio battalion, I was humping a radio. And I'm packing up to go to this exercise. And my first sergeant comes over and he starts hand, hand speed. And these these radios at the time were, you know, weighed 30 pounds, I guess. And the battery that went in weighed 10. And he's handing me these extra batteries and shoving them in my rucksack that was already, you know, weighing 40, 45 pounds. And I looked at him and I said, first sergeant, you know, do you really think I'm going to need to help all these batteries? And he looked at me. He goes, he goes, Marine, he goes, remember this. As long as you can communicate, you can do anything. But when you fail and when you lose the ability to communicate, you're on your own, brother. And you don't want to find yourself there. And that has stuck with me throughout my whole life because it, it, is, it is one of those nuggets of information that is absolute truth. And that is that not only as long as you can communicate, you can accomplish things, but failure in communication it is going to lead to ultimate failure soon enough because no man, nobody's an island here and we're all working in group environments and you must have the ability to communicate and both, you know, spoken communications, written communications. And, you know, we, that, that is one of the most quintessential skills that we all need to develop. And, uh, you know, most, Vets inherently do have that skill. So, yeah, for sure. That's as we as we begin to um, wrap it up, I mean, we covered a lot of ground, so I know everybody's going to have to want, go back and watch this one maybe a couple times. Um, but, but I love all the great wisdom and and unpacking it on top of that through story. Right, so you, a lot of these are unpacked through different stories throughout Max's career. So. Uh, it's colorful, it's relatable, and really appreciate your time. We typically end on professional development of some sort. You know, what what is like one or two books or resources that you could recommend that might help a veteran as they begin to walk through that transition uh, from the military to civilian service? Well, Jeremy, I'll, I'll just say this. Any book that you read is someone's opinion. And so, so never, never, ever forget that. 
in spite of how good the book may be, how instructive it may be, how intuitive it may be, how well it may align with your current knowledge, your current value system, how, how, how misaligned it may be. That's one person's opinion of the information that they gathered and they consider them to be facts and that's what they're presenting to you. So you can't really go wrong in any kind of book on project management. As long as you realize there's a difference between academia and the real world. The, the PMIs um, in, in the PMBOK, their, their description and definitions of, of how a project is organized and how it's initiated and things like that. It's spot on. It's not incorrect at all, but you know, that, that's not the way projects are managed on planet earth. You know, they, they may be on, on planet PMI. That may be exactly how everything goes. So you, you have to remember that. Um, I, uh, I, You've you've caught me at a loss here as far as uh, as as an actual title. I would I'd you know I I'm not being self serving this. I truly mean it. Uh, Doc's book on on learn the learning the 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 Civ Speak uh, dictionary. You know that's an excellent spot on about you know the hundred things you know that that. You know that that are just great little nuggets of knowledge and information. Um, to be honest with you, I highly recommend trade magazines as opposed to books. Uh, pick up a copy of ENR, Engineering News Record Magazine. That lists on a monthly basis all the major construction projects being done all over the world. It gives the most important information is it gives you contact information. If you're interested in, in working on one of these projects, getting on the job, there's, there's information there that you can seek out and figure out how to do it. Uh, using, uh, there's a, there, personally, I subscribe to Offshore Engineer mag, uh, magazine, which it is like ENR. It lists, it covers monthly all the, the major construction projects and subsea construction projects and offshore construction projects going on in the energy business, whether it's alternative energy, wind energy, uh, solar, uh, wave energy, or oil and gas, you know, uh, hydrocarbon. So so I, I really think the currency of magazines and whether they're digital mag magazines or print magazines, are much more current because of the of the time it takes to go to press and to 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 write a book and to publish a book and get the book known and get it out there. By the time you most times you pick up the copy, it's two or three years old. The information. So. Oh man, so I, don't, I, I don't think you. Yeah, you couldn't. You probably couldn't have a more fresh take on it. I mean, <laughs> reflecting in the fact that you know books are a lot of opinion, or mm -hmm. at least you know the way that the author. Uh, perceived the information, codified it, then, you know, re-encoded it in a book. If you read a lot of them, you can probably sift that out. But I love the fresh take on the uh, trade magazines, right? Professional magazines, not time, not like, uh, you know, just the, the, the star or inquire, right? We're talking about professional trade magazines authored by the people doing the projects because it's very empirical knowledge. I did this. This was the result. This is what it cost. This is how long it took. I mean, it's very concrete and it's recency, right? That it's very um, a recent knowledge. So it's accurate back to the accuracy, right? So, I mean, it, it's just really cool. It's a really good take on, hey, what would be some professional reading? What's the profession you want to be in? Uh, what do you want to do when you grow up? What's the professional? What are the professionals in that career field doing and producing and, and putting out in the world, start consuming that because then your vernacular will be aligned with what you want to do. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, you know, and that overcomes one of the biggest and, and gang, we're not saying this. He didn't say read every trade journal for every trade profession across the globe. He said, pick one or two that are recognized in whatever industry you want to go in and read that one. And you only got to read it for a couple of weeks or a couple of issues, a couple hours of your life. And that overcomes one of the biggest hurdles we hear all the time from veterans. We help thousands a year and they always say, yeah, but 
I don't have any project management experience in the civilian workforce. I don't have any HR management experience in the civilian workforce. I don't have any X experience insert here in the civilian workforce. I'll tell you what, you read a couple of trade journals and you figure out that a professional engineer, a professional HR director, a professional X is doing the exact same thing you did. You'll see parallels in what they're doing and what you did. And then you'll, like Jeremy said, you'll start to use that language. And now you sound like the same folks reading those journals because you're all doing the same kind of work, right? So and Max, I just, Jeremy, you're going to, you're going to kick me in the shin for this, bro. And, and listening audience, I just, I promise it'll be less than 10 more minutes, but I, I would be remiss if I let Max out of here without asking him one thing. You, it's mentioned no less than a dozen times in the PMBOT guide. It's made my career. It's made Max's career. It got Max a mentorship and the kid that asked Max to mentor him is now on his way to being CEO somewhere. Max. What are a couple practical things that a guy or gal listening could do because project management, one of the biggest skills you got to have in communication is the ability to facilitate. Meetings will go awry. Conversations will go awry. And a good, skilled facilitator, open-ended questions, close-ended questions, take charge of a meeting, whiteboard it out. And it's not Eric's plan. It's just, hey, this is what Max heard and copied down on a whiteboard. Everybody can see it. Everybody gets literally on the same page. I think facilitation is one of the most underrated, undertrained skills that any professional could have, especially a project manager. So Max, how did you learn to do that? Because when I was at the schoolhouse, brother, there was no block of instruction on how to be a facilitator. But you I, sure do know a good one when you see them, don't you? You what sure do. They could do. And, and I agree with you 100%. And, and I think, once again, one of the advantages you, you have in the military is this worldwide travel. To become a good facilitator, you need a breadth of knowledge. You know, you, you know, you know as, as a PhD, a PhD picks a, a speck of knowledge and you drill down on it and you learn every single thing there is to know about that particular speck of knowledge. A project manager needs to be his his knowledge and information needs to be much more broadly based. So anything you can can read or the most important thing, I think, is traveling. I, I remember discovering that, you know, back hundreds of years ago, wealthy families would take their teenage children and they would send them on travels around the world to go go travel the world, go go learn from the world. You, you meet people who come from different experiences in different places and have different cultures, everything. And you, number one, you become open-minded to, to that just because that's not the way I would have done it or that's not the way I perceive it doesn't mean that's not the way they perceive it. And, and, there's, and without being judgmental, you know, it's, it's not wrong just because it's different. It's just different. And being able to recognize immediately that, hey, differences are going to exist. OK, we all have differences. We're not cut out of a cookie cutter mold somewhere. So you have to learn that. Uh, one of the things we learned as as junior enlisted guys is you spend a whole lot more time listening than you do talking. Nobody really wants to know what a private opinion is of anything. OK, but they expect you to sit in a in a classroom or a school circle or in a in a in, in a training environment somewhere. And they expect you to listen and learn. One of the greatest things you can do as a leader is learn to listen. And you need to listen to what your teammates and, and are saying and how they're saying it. And, and why are they saying it? are they angry? Are they frustrated or are they just wrong? Do they have to have them made a mis misperception? But you need to learn to listen to people and figure out why they are saying what they're saying. Not not so much what they're saying, but why they're saying it. Why, why do they feel that way? And and if it's if it's something that you can if there's if it's a problem that you can correct, take that on and try to fix that. But uh, but I agree with you. Facilitate being able to to. And coming from the experience of having, you know, worked in, and lived in other countries around the world, you are a much more well-rounded person. And 
and you you are much more accepting of other people. And and hey, I tell you, I, I was surprised working in Houston, Texas. I've never been in a more diverse environment in my life. I mean, the most companies that I worked in in Houston as a as a white male American, I was a minority. Uh, mo- it, it was it was there was very few majorities of any sex, uh, nationality, uh, uh, anything that you want. It, it, it truly was is a, a, a melting pot and a hodgepodge of people from all over the world. And once again, guys in the military who are have experienced that from day one and then during their whole career. But, um, but yes, facilitating is, is, is something I think as we get older, uh, because of the experiences we we gained in life and we've earned, we can relate to people better. And uh, that's that. And it's that, that the whole thing, you know, is about being empathetic and having uh, 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 empathy for the people that you're working with, whether they're a client or they're a teammate or they're a customer, doesn't make any difference. You need to, to develop this professional empathy, uh, empathy so you can, uh, you can deal with these people. Yeah, well said. Well said. I love it. You know, and and Doc's got he's you know he's writing down all these uh, notes from just what you said, and it's it it boiled down to you. It's hopefully it's okay, Doc, that I I read them out loud. But it was all about being curious, right? It started there, listening actively. Uh, I've always heard too is listen as if you have to teach it, mm-hmm. right? So not just listen so that you understand, but listen like you're about to teach the next person behind you, which is all about that servant leadership. I know that that helped me personally. Like when I would listen to a briefing, it's like, well, I'm going to have to go brief my folks, right? And that means I better listen hard enough to where I can pick up the important information to relay it. Also, um, asking questions, right, for clarification. If, If you can get on the same page, like you said in the very beginning, just to bring it full circle, we're not all that different. We just see things differently. We pick up different details, but in reality, we all want to be, we all want to belong to the process. We all want to have a purpose. We all want to do good at what we're trying to do. Um, And we do that by being on the same sheet of music. And really, I think that's at the heart of facilitation. So I don't know, doc, what, I stole all your thunder. Sorry. No, JB, that's it. As Max was talking, I mean, those are just the tactical things I heard listening audience if you're not watching i mean those are tactical things that you can do in your next meeting that make you stand out as a facilitator i've had promotions because i could facilitate because i could communicate and executives would say that in their promotion recommendations hey this project manager listens hey this guy uh, collaborates this guy i literally have an expo pin and a dry erase marker and stand at the front of the board and say okay jeremy i think what i heard you saying was this you write it down. I'm being empathetic. I'm appreciating that we all have differences and we all see it differently. I'm asking questions for clarification. I'm summarizing with closed-ended questions or statements. I'm actively listening. It's, 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 I, I think Max said it, it's being attentive to the individuals in the room that we have to collectively work amongst to get a collective goal done. If you can learn to do that, on a whiteboard so everybody can see where we're different. Everybody can see where we have common ground. Then we can move towards, okay, now we got common ground. The common goal is this. How do we get there? You'll, you'll shine. And it's not really anything you're doing. You're just capturing what everybody else is doing and saying, and putting on a whiteboard somewhere. So somebody can take a picture or take notes later for dissemination. And that's facilitation. In my humble opinion, I'm not a certified facilitator, but but man, if you can do that and you just practice that skill over and over and over, you will stand out. People know a great facilitator when they see it and they know a lousy one when they see it and they know it when it's absent. It's painful. Yeah. Hey, Doc, and I would like to just make an appeal to everyone who's listening out there uh, as far as, as as veterans that are contemplating or faced with with transitioning from the military to uh, to the, the civilian world. As as I've said, I know for a fact that going into project management uh, is a lucrative uh, opportunity that you have is to to support your family and to provide for your family. but. I want to appeal to a much more fundamental uh, um, 
characteristic that we a lot of us have, and that is this ability to want to help and want to contribute to an organization. It, it was my experience everywhere I traveled in the, the civilian world, the weakest part of every single organization was middle management. And I came from an organization in the military where the strongest part of every organization was the middle manager. The petty officers and the chiefs and the junior officers, they were the strength of every organization. They they were the guys that got up every day and got the work done. They, you know, the, the senior officers, uh, they they took care of the organization and and its place in uh, in in our mission role accomplishment. The junior guys, the junior enlisted guys, they just weren't trained and equipped properly enough to um, to carry on. But in the civilian world, middle management is an easy place to hide. You you're not the worker. You're not accomplishing stuff. You're not getting it done. So if it doesn't get done, uh, it, you know it's not your fault. You're you're not the senior guys who they're looking at the success of the organization and the success of the company. That's what they're focused on. So what they expect from middle management is to take the resources that are available to you and to safely accomplish the work that the tasks that are assigned to you and do it in a way that produces a profit for the company. That's what your job is. And if you've spent four years or 24 years in the military, trust me, you know how to do just that. You can go into an organization at the middle management area and as a project manager or as an HR manager or an HR professional, that's where you, 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 you're cracked to get in the door. You, you go into the organization and you start from day one helping their, the organization improve and to be successful and to be profitable. And as you work within that organization, you will see you will grow within that organization. You will be provided opportunities to grow within that organization. And it's it's just a great opportunity. There wasn't a day that went by uh, that I worked in the civilian world that I didn't reflect back to something that I had learned or or some experience that made me better prepared for the day to day challenges that I had to accept in my civilian job, I had been prepared for because of my military career. So it's a, it, and I, and I make this appeal to anyone out there in the military who's looking to get out, you know, give project management, at least, at least look at, at least consider it because you can make a good living for your family to support your family. You can, it's a very rewarding, professionally rewarding uh, uh, opportunity for you. And uh, and you'll make great friends and you will you will become you'll you know, you it's, it's it was very enjoyable to me. The work was very enjoyable. Wow. Yeah. And you probably are an expert at it already. <laughs> but you know what? I was always told an X is a has been a spurts a little drip. I don't, I'm not an expert. So <laughs> the uh, well, so I mean, obviously so great. I mean, the even the last 10 minutes of it, even though we're a little bit over on time, was it could have been a show on its own, right? The the shirking middle manager. It's so easy to hide there in civilian world, and so hard to hide there in the military. And it just, just that equation of, wow, how how does that how does how did we do it so right in the military? And then you know maybe no, I'm not disparaging every civilian man, middle manager because that's not true. That's not where that's not reality. But from what we're saying here is how do they get it wrong? You know, is it is it an oversight thing? The answer to your question is accountability. Yeah. And it's it's it accountability exists in the military. It not doesn't necessarily exist in the civilian world. It's too easy to move non-performers around. And typically they're moved up to they entice them to take the move by offering them a move up. But where the whole plan is just to get rid of. So yeah. uh, and that's yeah. not acceptable in the military. Perfect. Perfect answer. Doc, what do you got to f- close out? That's it, man. That right, that right there was icing on this cake. Yeah, I, I can't agree more. Thank you for Thanks, tuning Matt. in and spending a bit of time with us at the Military Transition Academy powered by vets to pm If we piqued your interest, but you want more details, please head over to the website vets 2 and see if we can help prepare you for a better tomorrow 
or a future meaningful and lucrative career.